Good evening, everybody. Starting to see some people come in. Hey, Brian, good evening. Hey, guys. Everybody. Good to see everybody. I know this will, Josh is amazing, our speaker, and will definitely be better than the Super Bowl. So you guys are in for a good treat tonight. Is everyone muted, Jennifer? Including me, yes. Uh, yes, they are. Okay. You guys can unmute yourselves if you want. We got a couple of minutes before we'll get started. How's everyone? Just fine, Rabbi. Good, thank you. Good, good. Fine, good. Are people starting to get their vaccines? We have them already. Yeah, we yeah, great. Had, uh, we both had both of ours. Fantastic. Yeah, both. Good. Good. Well, good. Well, God willing, more and more people start to get them, and uh, we'll all be safer soon. That's great news. It's it's a perk to be old. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be something, I like, you know? <laughs> You've earned it. You've earned the. Uh, opportunity to get it no doubt about it thank you <laughs> for sure it, it looks like our speaker is the youngest person on the video and our <laughs> second youngest is our rabbi <laughs> so far that's right oh, there's a few other people there i'm seeing now let us Maybe know when you guys fixed. get the vaccine then we'll know the world is good <laughs> yeah yeah i've got i've got 2022 circled on my calendar right now <laughs> <laughs> hope not. Yeah, I hope not. I'm optimistic, though. I think I know there's more vaccines coming on the pipeline. Look, if we were all Israelis, it'd be very easy. I'm sure y'all been seeing the news in Israel. They can't give it away. They're having a hard time getting people to show up now. They've got so much. It's anyone 16 and over can get it now. Well, I've so, had uh, maybe we should all make Ali off. <laughs> make it a little bit easier to get <laughs> but no god will it'll be soon but I, I mean it's uh hopefully i hope to see all of y'all soon whenever everyone feels safe coming to synagogue we'd love to see you but stay safe and uh but i appreciate you guys being part of this do we still have to register to come to services you do. Entering you do for the time being. Lines. Correct. Central American police officers being attacked by Americans. But it's very easy to do. Jennifer makes it very easy. And she's always there to help. Does an amazing job with that. Jennifer, I hope you have broad shoulders. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, let me make a couple announcements and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael to introduce our speaker. Um, our next program is actually a month from tonight. Um, on February 28 days, it makes it very easy. March 10th, we're having my friend Stephen Sheldon, and he's going to be speaking about finding well-being, financial well-being in life. And he's got some great advice, some things to surprise you. He's not necessarily dealing just with our financial well-being, but other ways in which to bring more calmness into our lives. I think it's a lot of what we can learn right now and really get a lot out of the discussion. Steven's a great speaker. He's, got, he's a good comedian as well. So I think you'll enjoy his presentation. He's going to have some uh, multimedia parts of his presentation as well. He's already been sharing some of it with me. I think you guys will really enjoy it. So it's a month from tonight, March 10th. And that's our next 100 Jewish Men's program. So I'd love to see you guys there for that. And uh, let me turn it over to our steering committee member, one of my friends, Michael Wiesenthal, to introduce our speaker. Michael, you there? Michael, you might be muted if you're there. Jennifer, do you see Michael on the list? I thought I saw him. I thought I did too. 
Although I don't see them right now. Uh, we may have lost them. All right, well, in the meantime, I'll go and pull up Josh's bio. And if you see Michael come back on, Jennifer, let me know. Will do. So we are honored tonight to have my friend and someone who's done a lot for our community. Dr. Josh Furman is a native of San Antonio and is the founder and curator of the Houston Jewish History Archive at Rice University, where he also serves as a lecturer in the program of Jewish studies. His most recent publication is a chapter about Jewish Houston in the book, Making Houston Modern, The Life and Architecture of Howard Bardstone, which was published this year by the University of Texas Press. Press. He also authored an essay on migration in American Jewish history for the volume, Interpreting American Jewish History at Museums and Historic Sites. Currently, he's working on an article about Jews who immigrated to the US through Galveston, and his long-term plans involve writing a book about the history of Houston's Jewish community. Dr. Furman received his PhD in modern Jewish history from the University of Maryland, in 2015. So, and I wanna add it on a personal note, and some of you may know this, but Josh was one of the first people on the scene after our synagogue flooded over three years ago after Hurricane Harvey there to save a lot of our archives, to catalog them and to preserve the history of our congregation. And I've had the pleasure of visiting him at work and seeing just the incredible contribution the Houston Jewish Archives and Dr. Furman have made to our Jewish community. It's really incredible, Joshua, what you've done in just a few short years you've been here in Houston. So I can't thank you enough. We can't thank you enough. And we're honored to be with you tonight to learn from you this evening. So without further ado, let's welcome our friend, Dr. Josh Furman. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rabbi, for that introduction. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thanks to Jennifer for um, running the show behind the curtain. It's so nice to see familiar faces, uh, to meet some new people tonight. Um, what I'd like to do in our time together is, first of all, for those of you who are learning about the Houston Jewish History Archive for the first time, uh, I'm going to give a very short introduction to what it is that we do. Um, and then as a, as a subject for this evening's program, I thought it might be interesting to talk about Texas Jewish history and, and Texas Jews, and how we fit in or don't fit in to the paradigm of Southern Jewish history. Um, in one of the many roles that I fill, I'm on the board of uh, the Southern Jewish Historical Society, and we always sort of argue within the group, is, is Texas part of the South? Is Texas part of the West? Is Texas just Texas? Where does where does Texas fit in? Um, the other place we argue about is Florida, but I, I, I couldn't be less interested in Florida. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be discussing that tonight. Um, some of you may have seen bits and pieces of this presentation before, um, and I beg your patience. Um, if I have time at the end, what I would love to be able to do is to show you um, some of the many places on the internet where Beth Yashurin historical material that we saved uh, from Hurricane Harvey, thanks in large part, by the way, to the efforts of David Bell, who I know is, is uh, part of the group tonight, and Arlene Stoller, we've managed to digitize a huge chunk of it, and you can actually look at it all uh, on your computer or on your iPad if you know where to look. So if I get five minutes of, of bonus time at the end, I'll try to do that. Um, if you have questions or comments, I would very much like for this to be um, a conversational experience and, and uh, you know, to have the opportunity to hear from you. So don't be shy. Type your uh, comments or questions into the chat window. Jennifer will see them. I'll see them. And I'll try to pause about every 10 minutes or so um, to see if there are any comments there. So let's go ahead and get started with tonight's presentation. And we're gonna be thinking about, as I said, what's Southern about us Texas Jews? And I don't know that we'll come to any kind of conclusive answers. Certainly scholars haven't come to any sort of conclusive answer, but I think we'll have fun trying. I think we'll have fun discussing and debating. Um, so I, I am the founder and curator of the Houston Jewish History Archive, which was formally established in 2018, but the seeds of it were planted in 2017 
um, as a response to Hurricane Harvey, as Rabbi Strauss mentioned. Um, and this is the, I don't have too many historian action shots, uh, but this is, this is one. Uh, this is a picture taken by Michael Duke, formerly of the Jewish Herald Voice, of what Stein Hall looked like in September of 2017, just a week after Hurricane Harvey. Um, and um, gosh, I haven't been in Stein Hall in, in a year. Uh, it, it really it really hits me each time I look at this picture. Um, but um, I was part of a massive effort that included Beth Yashurin clergy and community volunteers um, and Beth Yashurin staff and students from Rice to try to recover the historical materials of Beth Yashurin and UOS uh, after the flood. And you can see here that unfortunately, um, the floodwaters did ruin a substantial percentage of Beth Yashur and historical uh, documents and photographs, but most of it we were able to save. And it was out of this effort that we um, decided with some seed funding to create the archive. At that time, there really was no systematic um, effort or institution on the ground in Houston to collect historical material about Jewish life here. So uh, we decided to jump in. And since then, we really haven't ever stopped. Um, so we collect, preserve, and make accessible the documents, the photographs, the artifacts, and the stories that um, illuminate Jewish life in uh, greater Houston, but also in South Texas. It's fun to look at this picture because the JCC is, you know, of course, in its in its next phase of rebuilding. And here's a picture of the South Braidswood building when it was still under construction. And of course, the old building on Herman Drive with uh, Slugger Cohen there under the banner, those of you who remember Slugger Cohen. Um, the HHA is a collaboration between the program in Jewish studies at Rice and the Woodson Research Center and Fondren Library, which is our special collections division. And um, increasingly, as we've grown the archive, we've realized that we can't only concentrate on Houston because so many Jewish Houstonians have roots in other parts of the state. Um, and so you can see here on your screen some of the other cities and communities that we have collected both uh, information but also photographs and um, documentary material from. Um, and it's a list that continues to grow and expand with each coming year. So what do we do here at the archive? Well, we collect and acquire, as I've been saying, the documents and photographs. We have audio recordings, video recordings, and other materials. And I'm hopeful at the end of the program tonight, you'll get to see and listen to some of that stuff. We digitize as much of it as we can, both to preserve it, but also to make it accessible to you wherever you live. Um, since the pandemic, we've started doing more oral history work, interviewing Jewish Houstonians about their family history and their experiences during the pandemic. Um, we do various lectures and public programs in the community, and you can find us both um, on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on our website, which I hope to be able to show you in a little while. Um, the things that we collect pertain to the Texas Jewish experience, so it has to be related in some way to how Jewish Texans have lived their lives. Um, we collect documents about family history, scrapbooks, diaries, letters. Some of you watching this program tonight um, have given us these materials and we're very honored. Uh, we collect life cycle materials, confirmation photos, bar and bat mitzvah, wedding uh, photos and programs. We have um, institutional records from uh, Beth Yashurin and UOS and other synagogues in Texas. Also organizations like the JCC and Federation. We have a collection of material from Texas Jewish military veterans. And as I said, various artifacts and audio and video recordings as well. Um, Pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the archive is a community resource. So uh, were it not for COVID, you could come to the Rice campus and uh, visit us in the library Monday through Friday. Unfortunately, um, although it's great to hear that many of you have been vaccinated, which is a, is a wonderful development, uh, we are still not open to the public again. Um, but eventually, I hope in the coming months, you'll be able to come back and, and visit us. Um, and until then, you know, you can, you can access our materials from our digital catalog that I'll show you. Okay, so that is the five minute introduction for those of you who've never heard of the archive before. 
um, to what the HJHA is. And I'm happy to take questions or speak with anybody offline who's interested in learning more about that. But the topic I promised you for tonight is thinking about Texas and Texas Jews as being distinctive in some way, or really not. And in order to jump into this conversation, we have to think, first of all, about Texas. Um, this is not my thesis. I did not develop this idea. This is a, an idea that journalists and historians and people who write about Texas um, have sort of long espoused. But one way of taking a bird's eye view of Texas is of thinking about I-35 as a kind of dividing line. So you see here on your screen, and many of you I'm sure have, you know, you've, you've driven 35 in your lives, but 35 really bifurcates the state of Texas into two different worlds, almost. Um, to the east of 35, right, East Texas, that's first of all where um, the state's major cities are. And the history of East Texas is not all that unlike the history of um, the Deep South. Cotton was um, the major economic driving force in uh, the early history of the state before the oil boom. Um, Jim Crow and slavery were uh, part and parcel of Texas life. And so this region of Texas is sort of its own world. As you move you know, north and, and west and you cross this dividing line, that's when we start to get into, you know, cattle and cowboy country and um, frontier and mountains and desert and the terrain shifts. And I think also the, the culture and the mind shift, um, the mindset shifts, excuse me, a little bit um, as well. There are other ways of sort of thinking about Texas, but this is one that I find particularly compelling. I'm wondering if you find it compelling as well. So how do we think about Texas as being um, distinct from the rest of the South or being part of the rest of it? I think that you know one of the things that might be unique about Texas compared to Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, would be obviously the enduring influence of Spanish and Mexican culture on Texas life. Almost every aspect of Texas life that you that pops to mind when you try to think of what's iconic about Texas has its roots in um, Spanish and Mexican culture. Think about iconic Texan foods, right? Tacos, chili, barbecue, all borrowed from Spanish uh, Mexican cuisine, right? Adapted. Um, there's an old there's an old Yiddish saying, um, which may or may not be appropriate here: "Far teicht and far bessert." Um, which means translated and improved. I don't know why that just popped into my head. They, uh, when they used to publish Yiddish translations of Shakespeare back in the day, they would take all kinds of creative license with, uh, with the stories, right? Because there, there were no copyright protections and nobody was watching. So they would, you know, change the ending to Shakespeare, um, you know, this or that. And they'd put a disclaimer in the, you know, on the front page, far tights and far better, translated and improved. So is Tex-Mex an improvement on authentic Mexican cuisine? You decide, but um, the origins of it, I think clearly are there. Mexican holidays are part of the local cultural calendar. Um, you know, my children have, have celebrated Dia de los Muertos in, in preschool. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, again, for better or for worse, is a, is a holiday that many of us, um, have observed, even if we don't know what it is. Um, and even the rodeo, which again, sadly, we're, we're gonna go another year without the rodeo here in Houston, right? Has its, has its origins in, um, in this foreign culture. Now, obviously there are other regions of the country, Arizona, New Mexico, and Florida, where Spanish um, and Latin American influence runs very strong. But if we're trying to distinct, if we're trying to draw a distinction between Texas and the classic South or the Mississippi Delta, I think this is, might be one area um, to look. Now, what about Jewish Texans? Because it's one thing to talk about Texas. 
it's quite another to think about our place in Texas history and in Texas culture. So is there anything distinctive or special about Jewish Texans? Are we different from other Jewish Southerners in any appreciable way? Um, and there's two ways to answer this question, at least, right? As with any good Jewish question. The first is to say, no, there's nothing at all distinctive about Jewish Texans, right? The story of Jews coming to Texas is completely indistinguishable from Jews who went to any other part of the South or even heck, uh, you know, Nevada or Oregon or um, Wyoming, right? There's absolutely nothing different or distinctive about the Jewish Texan experience. That would be one end of the spectrum, one possible answer. Um, and the other would be to say that no, there is something unique about Texas, the Texan mystique, right? We are a, a, a class of people and a class of Jews unto ourselves. Um, if we're going to make that argument, though, we've got to be ready to put our finger on what exactly it is that's distinctive about Jewish Texans. So I'm going to go through now with you in a minute a list of some ways in which Texas Jews are really not all that distinctive from our um, our uh, compatriots in other parts of the South and in the context of Southern Jewish history. Before I do that though, as promised, I see there are um, some interesting comments and questions in the chat window. So let's just take a peek and let's see what's going on. Um, Chuck Brownman says, is the Jewish archive open to the public? Yes. As I explained, um, it will be. I don't know when that'll be. Um, the, the decisions about opening campus to non-Rice uh, visitors are way above my pay grade. Um, but keep in touch with me and I will let you know. Um, my email, uh, oh, someone posted my faculty page to the chat. That's great. I'll also include my email and my phone number um, at the end of the presentation as well, if you need it. And then will you give us a link to the online that people can see now? Yeah. Um, I, well, I'm not going to do it now because I don't want you. No, to no, I mean at some point. Talking, but yes, no, I'll be happy to give out. I'll be happy to give out all the links. I was so worried, by the way, when I signed on. Did you guys see the thing that went viral about the lawyer who had a cat filter? My kids do that to me all the time. My six-year-old. Does does Ulpan does Hebrew on the computer and she puts on all kinds of filters and I have definitely signed into some work meetings with pink eyebrows. I was terrified, but luckily I uh, we seem to be we seem to be okay. All right, let's jump back in, guys. Thanks for your patience. Keep the questions and comments coming. All right, so one of the central themes in the field of Southern Jewish history is, and again, it's not even that unique to, to Southern Jewish history, except that people outside of the South don't think about the South, um, is this idea that Jews and other immigrants came to the South and they found here um, a kind of promised land, a land of opportunity. And one of the classic expressions of this um, was um, comes from an editorial written by one of the earliest Jewish Houstonians. Um, you may recognize the name Levy. It's a common name, but it's uh, one of the earliest Houston Jewish families. And here's Louis Levy. And Louis Levy wrote this editorial in a national Jewish newspaper, um, trying to recruit Jews to come to Texas. And uh, here's what he wrote. In our own state, thousands of acres of land can be bought within the settled portions of the state for the small sum of from 25 cents to a dollar per acre. Acre, excuse me. Good, arable, fertile land where a man can make his living to his liking and more independent than the autocrat of Russia or the emperor of Austria themselves. Indeed, I would not exchange my 15 acre lot with the house on it and the garden around it which I possess near the city of Houston for all thrones and hereditary dominions of both those noted persons. For we will see if we live 
who will have a shelter of their own 15 years from now. So Levi, at this early date, when there were hardly any Jews living here, right, only, only um, a few dozen at most, was really bullish on the notion that Texas could provide Jews both with physical safety, um, but also with economic opportunity. And we see this expressed not only uh, here by Lewis Levy, but also in uh, what was known as the Galveston Movement. I'm writing an article right now for the Journal of Southern Jewish History about this incredible pamphlet that we uh, at the archive acquired from a rare Judaica bookseller in New York City. And what this is, is a pamphlet that was printed um, in Kiev in 1907 to try to recruit Jews to uh, get out of the shtetl and come to Galveston. Um, and then from Galveston to be dispersed through the greater South and um, Midwest. And I don't have time to go too deeply into this. For those of you less familiar with it, we can talk about this another time. Um, but this pamphlet has to convince a bunch of Yiddish speaking shtetl Jews that Texas is um, the place for them. So here you can see this is a piece of the pamphlet and there's Texas in Yiddish. And here's like a couple pages of description in Yiddish of what Texas is like in 1907. I mean, how fun is this? I have the neatest job. Um, so I, I, I can read some Yiddish, but we had this professionally translated by my friend Maurice Wolfthal um, here in Houston. So here's just a snippet of, snippet of it for you. The state of Texas is the largest of all the United States um, and is larger than all of France. That's pretty neat. Its soil is especially fertile for grazing cattle and cotton plants, except for its southern section. Sorry, guys. Its climate is good for your health, especially in the winter months. And then he goes on to tell you how diverse the state is, um, where the Jews live, right? The fact that it's a relatively unpopulated um, space and it has lots of empty space for new immigrants. So there's lots of opportunity to come to Texas in the early 1900s um, and find your fortune. Anyway, really exciting. So that would be sort of one way in which I think Texas Jewish history and Southern Jewish history um, find this overlap. Because really in the 19th century, there were um, tens of thousands of Jews who chose not to settle in New York, but who came south and who really were able to make an impact. And building on that idea is um, what I call the rise of the retail giants. Um, Jews who came to Texas and um, created these monumental, I mean, game-changing um, retail empires. I'm thinking, of course, of Sakowitz and Neiman Marcus um, and Zales, and that's just that's just three. I mean, we could talk about Battlesteins, and we could talk about Sanger Brothers, and we could talk about um, Gordon Jewelers, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, but this idea that you know, other immigrants came, other European immigrants came to the South to farm. We Jews came to the South to sell things to them. Right, that was that was the economic niche that was available to us in the uh, 1800s and in the first half of the 1900s. And uh, not all, but many Jewish families uh, did quite well this way in Texas history. Uh, and in the archive, we actually have a growing uh, collection of some of these signature uh, Houston Jewish businesses. So you can see here we have um, from the Tuman family a wonderful collection of star furniture. Uh, material and uh, from the Weingarten family, um, some neat photos of um, the Weingarten's grocery chain. Pretty fun. Another way in which Texas Jewish history tracks well with um, broader themes in Southern Jewish history would be the ways in which we Texas Jews have really tried to adapt to local culture and customs. Um, and one of the ways that this theme jumps out the most 
is if you look at what we eat, right? If you if you examine Texas Jewish food culture, uh, I'm a big fan, as as many of my uh, colleagues are in in um, Jewish history and studying cookbooks. Because if you study what Jews eat, you learn a lot about Jewish identity and Jewish culture. Um, so here is the oldest cookbook that we have in, in our collection in the archive. It may well be the oldest Jewish cookbook produced in Texas, but I'm not 100% sure. But this is a cookbook that was produced um, by Beth Israel, as you see, very, very early on. And I kid you not, on page nine, there is a recipe for how to cook and serve a possum dinner. Um, pretty remarkable, right? Uh, that is a, or I guess maybe was, a quintessential um, Texas dish. So we can see how Texas Jews have tried, you know, over time to um, adapt and bring some of these local customs into their lives. This is another one that I that Did I really love. Hook? It's uh, much more recent. Um, this is a, a, a split hook book from Galveston Hearts. Just a second. Okay. <laughs> was there a question? I, I said, does a possum have a split hoof or shoe its cud? You know, Rabbi Strauss has left us. I do not believe possum is kosher. <laughs> okay. I, I do not believe the members of Beth Israel in the early 1900s were particularly concerned with the dietary laws. Gotcha. Um, I can I can go on record saying and I and I don't mean it as a as an insult or a, or a dig. Um, the cookbook also has Easter and Passover recipes. Um, you know, it's there a go. great cookbook. It's fascinating. All right, thank you, Bill, for your question. Um, here's another one. This is a, a a Jewish cookbook from the National Council of Jewish Women, the Galveston section in 1950. Um, I could give a whole hour long talk about this cookbook. I really could. Uh, but the page I pulled out for you is the guacamole page. Now, why do I love this guacamole page so much? First of all, I love the dancing avocados and sombreros uh, because who doesn't love dancing avocados and sombreros? But if you look a little more carefully, you'll notice something interesting going on here, right? Guacamole is actually written in very tiny quotation marks, so tiny you could almost not see them. And beneath it, it says avocado cocktail dip. Now, why does it say avocado cocktail dip? Because it's 1950 and we have to explain to an audience of Texas Jewish homemakers what guacamole is, right? What's, what's guacamole? It's a, it's a local delicacy, right? A local Mexican delicacy that you might enjoy. Um, and here's what you do with it, uh, right? You can uh, use it as a salad, you know, put it on a lettuce leaf, right? Um, this, this to me is, is fascinating. And it shows the ways in which, you know, Texas Jews have been sort of eager to, you know, get in on, on local food trends and, and um, blend in. It, it's just great. Love that one. Um, finally, of course, and this again is an event that, that many of us I'm sure know and love and are looking forward to hopefully uh, next year, the kosher chili cook-off, right? Nothing says blending of Texas and Jewish food traditions like a kosher chili um, cook-off. I note that we are apparently way behind Dallas um, in our celebration of this, which um, which irks me, irks me a little bit. Um, we have some catching up to do. But um, again, it's, it's become part of the local Jewish community calendar here, the, the ritual eating of, of kosher chili every year. And it's an event the whole community participates in. And then lastly on food, um, this I love. There's um, from our um, archives of a congregation, Sheriff Israel in Wharton, Texas, which no longer exists. Um, they had an annual barbecue fundraiser that brought the whole community together. And we have, um, courtesy of my friend Libby Holland Marvins, this wonderful t-shirt. I survived the Sheriff Israel Barbecue in <laughs> Wharton, Texas, which is just great. Um, another theme in Southern Jewish history, which is quite prevalent, um, is uh, the extent to which Jews have been involved in political leadership at the local and state level. And this actually um, is an area where 
Jewish history in Texas and in the South uh, writ large really does stand out from Jewish history in the Northeast, um, where aside from representation at the very local level, um, it, took, it took much longer for Jews to break through um, the um, Brahmin, if you will, B-R-A-H-M-I-N, political culture of places like Boston and New York and some other cities. Whereas in Texas, uh, Jews became, Jews served as mayors, Jews served on city councils, um, right? Jews have um, been involved really from, from, from early days at um, representing um, Texas at various levels of local and state government. And who of course could forget, we almost, we almost had the governorship um, a couple times. Here's a souvenir poster uh, from Kinky Friedman's um, campaign back in 2006. Um, and an, an autograph note that we uh, received from a, from a donor. <laughs> Thank you for being an American. Best wishes, Kinky Friedman. That says it all. Um, moving right along, guys. And I see there's a couple more comments in the chat, so I'll, I'll pause in a moment to look at them. One of the other areas that uh, I think you see a fruitful overlap between the Texas Jewish experience and the Southern Jewish experience is in the primacy of interfaith relations and the extent to which rabbis in Houston, some more than others, um, have been the representatives of um, the Jewish community to the city um, or to the, to the Christian community. Um, and one of the ways that you see this historically is in the observance of something called Brotherhood Week. I don't know how many of you remember Brotherhood Week. It's typically observed around this time of year, um, around uh, Lincoln and Washington's birthdays. And um, for decades after World War II, it was a kind of national um, interfaith celebration. And it was observed here uh, in Houston at Emmanuel and also at Beth Yeshur and other um, congregations. And this idea of the Texas rabbi as an emissary to the Christian community has really been embodied by a number of um, famous Texas rabbis, probably none more famous than Henry Cohen and Galveston, um, but also in a lot of small towns that had Jewish communities uh, where Jews were really in the minority at places like Wharton um, come to mind. So that would be another area. Let me pop out for a second and just take a look at what's happening in the chat window and see what's going on. So um, Larry says, many Texas Jews arrived by boat via Galveston. We did, we did talk about that. Of the Jews who came to this country through Galveston, only about 3,000 or so um, of that group stayed in Texas. The, rent, the rest moved on to other um, destinations. But that is a pretty significant number when you think about children and grandchildren and, and great-grandchildren um, and so forth. Uh, and a number of you have sent me some private messages about, um, about things. Hi, hi, Lou. Hi, Rabbi Horowitz. Great to, great to be here all with you. Um, John asks an interesting question. It's a little bit off topic. Um, so we're going we're gonna to ask it and then hold on to it. And maybe you guys have some thoughts on this too. Um, the Jewish populations of Dallas and Atlanta have grown exponentially in the past 20, 30 years. The Jewish population of Houston has remained relatively constant for the past 30 years or so. Why is that? I bet Lee Wunsch has some ideas. I'm going to put him on the spot later. Um, and you'll see, you'll actually see where, where Houston's Jewish um, community ranks in comparison to Dallas a little later on. That's an interesting food for thought question. I, I have some ideas. I bet you do too. Um, all right. So we've talked about this. Now we need to talk about race and race relations because you, you can't, as I think you know, many of us have, have always been aware, but many more of us I think are becoming newly aware that you, you really can't talk about the history of the United States and certainly not the history of the South and certainly not Southern Jewish history without reflecting on race relations and the unique role that Jews have played um, in the South and in Texas 
as uh, an ethnic group that on the one hand is not black or Hispanic and therefore enjoyed certain benefits and privileges. Um, but on the other hand was also never fully accepted, right? And has had to deal with uh, at times in our history, a resurgence of the, um, of the clan, for example, uh, or other kinds of uh, social prejudice or um, economic discrimination. And um, there are stories that we like to tell when we talk about Jews in the civil rights movement. Um, and I've spoken, on the, I've spoken on this theme in other contexts, right? But, um, you know, at one end of the spectrum, there were Jews nationally and of course locally um, who dedicated themselves quite strongly to the cause of civil rights. Um, locally, perhaps none more so than Rabbi Moshe Kahana of Rish Shalom, uh, seen here marching in Selma in uh, March of 1965 um, for the cause of uh, registering black voters. But there are other themes that we have to grapple with too if we're gonna confront the history of Texas Jews and race relations. Um, one of them has to do with the history of um, Jewish neighborhoods in Third Ward in Riverside Terrace, um, which was an area that is black uh, Texans started moving in to those neighborhoods in the 50s and 60s, nearly all Jewish families um, moved out. And they moved out for a complicated set of reasons and reasons that um, fit patterns um, elsewhere in the country. This was not a unique, the story of, of, of white flight or Jewish white flight, it's not unique to Houston, um, but it's an important story. And I think a story worth um, revisiting. This uh, sign that I'm showing you on the screen, for those of you unfamiliar with this, is the name both of a grassroots movement of uh, Jews and uh, other whites and black residents in, in Riverside in the 60s to try to preserve an integrated neighborhood. It's also the name of a wonderful documentary that was made in 1987 about the history of Houston's Riverside Terrace. Um, it's a little bit hard to find, but if you're able to um, get a copy of it, it, it it's, worth your, it's worth your attention. Um, and then finally, we also have to um, think about uh, the history of sit-in protests in Houston, which took place in 1960, um, and involved some Jewish-owned uh, businesses here. Um, and then again, Jews uh, played a role behind the scenes in helping to desegregate uh, the city following these protests. So the history of, of Jews and race relations in the South and in Houston is a very complicated one. It's one that defies um, quick sound bites or um, you know, simple characterizations. But as with all of these themes, I think, it's, I think it's an important topic for discussion. And it really does link the Texas Jewish experience to the wider Southern experience as well. Now you might say, and I think you might be right, that Houston and Houston's Jewish community um, as a whole perhaps adopted different attitudes towards race relations than Jews living in other parts of the South, particularly the Deep South. I don't have time to go into that, but if you wanna raise that um, in the chat, you certainly uh, should feel welcome to. Um, and we're almost, we're almost getting to the end of this, uh, of this part of the presentation, so never fear. Um, one of the ideas that gets talked a lot about now by historians who work on Southern Jewish history is the dichotomy between an old South, if you will, very much in decline and a new South very much on the rise. And by Old South, a lot of what we mean is um, small town Jewish life, right? It was not uncommon as, as late as uh, 20, 30 years ago to find small but, but active Jewish communities in small towns across Texas. Um, and uh, for the last couple of decades though, these communities have really, um, been suffering and shrinking. I mentioned Wharton earlier in the talk. This is a congregation B'nai Israel in Victoria, about uh, two hours uh, from us here in Houston, which still has a synagogue building and, and still has uh, members, but uh, you know is, is no longer meeting regularly. And um, that is a story that's you know being played out in many, many small towns across the South 
um, for decades now. By comparison though, and this brings us back to John's question from a few moments ago, um, in some of the larger cities in Texas and the South, a Jewish life is quite vibrant. Um, I, I forget if I took these numbers from the Jewish yearbook or where exactly I found them, but I found um, 75,000 for the Jewish population of Dallas, 51,000 give or take for, for us in Houston, about 25 in Austin and about 10,000 in San Antonio, which I don't know if that number is still accurate or not. That's when I was growing up in San Antonio 20 years ago, that's the number we used to use. I don't know if, if it's um, stayed the same or not. Um, and the true, you know, the, the same would be true for other, I mean, obviously Atlanta, Memphis, uh, Nashville, um, and I imagine places like um, Charlotte as well, to say nothing of, of you know, Miami, obviously. Um, have become, uh, you know, magnets for, for Jewish migration from other parts of the country. So we have two simultaneous narratives, one of uh, decline and, and disappearance, uh, but another one of, of um, some interesting growth. So kind of trying to, to sum up here some, some thoughts. Okay, so Furman says that that's all the ways in which Texas Jews and Southern Jews have a lot in common. Well, what do we not have in common with our, um, our neighbors in um, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, um, Georgia? I think, you know, these are, these are obviously up for debate, but I think, again, for me, one of the things that distinguishes Texas and distinguishes Texas Jewry is uh, the fact that we have a vital subgroup of Spanish-speaking Jews um, in our communities who come from Mexico, who come from um, Latin America, um, to say nothing of um, Spanish-speaking converts um, who have uh, joined our community and uh, who really contribute, I think, to the, to the vibrancy of um, Texas Jewish life, perhaps in ways that aren't always recognized or appreciated. Um, but the diversity of, of Texas Jewry doesn't stop there. As many of you know, um, there was a large migration of Jews from South Africa to Houston and Dallas in the uh, 70s and 80s, which uh, is, is just not true for other parts of the country, right? Um, for a number of reasons. And then I have sort of two other, two other bullet points. Um, and this third one has to do with Zionism. It, it seems to me, and you all can confirm or, or challenge this, but it seems to me that Zionism and Israel are central to Texas Jewish identity in a way that they're simply not central, uh, particularly on the East Coast and the West Coast. I, I left Texas um, when I was 17 and I spent time in Israel and I spent time in the Midwest and I spent um, over a decade on the East Coast after college. And um, I would say quite simply that there are many proud, active, observant Jews in these communities for whom, they, not that they are anti-Zionist, but they don't wake up thinking about Israel every day. They're not always checking the Jerusalem Post or Haaretz. And I think, and I, I, I say this as an observation, not as a judgment. But I think one of the things that I find really interesting coming back to Texas in my late 30s is that across the denominational spectrum in, in our community, and I think in Texas, Zionism holds a much more central um, place to our Jewish identity. Why is that? Is that because Texas Jews as a whole are, are more conservative than uh, Jews on the coasts? Is it because of a kind of synergy between Texas and Israel? as you know, Lone Star States, promised lands. You tell me, but I think, I think it's, 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 it's something that I've definitely perceived um, and I'm interested to, to think more about. Um, and then finally, there's this, in, you know, there's this indefinable sense of a Texas mystique, right? That Texas is, um, as some people continue to, you know, to believe, it's a country unto itself. Um, 
right? That it's it's unlike any other place on earth. And so the people who live here, the people who make up Texas are unlike people anywhere else um, on earth. And you can't quantify that, right? You can't produce hard evidence in court to, to justify that assertion, but you will encounter it everywhere, um, I assure you. So what do y'all think? I'm interested to hear from you. What is distinctive or special about Texas Jews? Um, what makes us interesting? What makes us different? Maybe the answer is nothing, but I'm not, I'm not fully convinced um, that it is. So I'm gonna pop out now and see where we're at in the chat window. Okay, Lou lost my audio. Lou, can you hear me now? How many fingers am I holding up? Uh, 17. Oh no. Oh no, we've lost Lou. We lost him completely. This, is, this has gone totally off the rails. Um, okay. Uh, I received a, a very interesting private message about um, uh, homes in um, older neighborhoods that are now predominantly black neighborhoods still having mezuzahs on them. That's a very interesting comment. I haven't seen that specifically with homes. However, and this is a phenomenon that's not just true of Houston, it's true of the entire United States. Um, many, many of... Um, Houston synagogues, well, I can think of at least one that's still standing. There are others that are no longer standing because they've been torn down for um, Discovery Green and other parts of that, of that area. Um, but the phenomenon by which um, synagogues become black churches, um, right, when, when, when Jews leave a neighborhood and, and more African Americans move in is, is something that, um, you know, but part of the architecture gets preserved. So if you know what to look for, you can still find um, the remnants of this. So here in Houston, there's sort of two examples. One would be the old Beth Jacob building at Cleburne and Hamilton Streets, uh, which is now True Light Baptist Church. Um, and the other would be the old Adathemeth building. Um, there are actually two still standing old Adathemeth buildings. One is the Central Police Supply um, building on Washington Avenue. Uh, and the other is now part of the Texas Southern University campus. I think it's the, I think it's a music building, uh, but that was a synagogue, and they uh, they sold it to TSU when they when they left. Um, all right. There was a question again from Lou about um, do we work with the Institute of Southern Jewish Life in New Orleans? So uh, yes and no. So the Institute for Southern Jewish Life is based in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and their history department is run by my good friend, Josh Parshall. And they actually, if you love Southern Jewish history and you don't know about this, I'm about to change your life. Um, if you go to isjl.org, and this isn't my work, I take no credit for this um, whatsoever. Um, but if you know uh, Stuart Rockoff, who is a uh, Houston Jewish product, um, Stuart was um, for many years the chief historian at the Institute for Southern Jewish Life. And he created an amazing, why isn't this working? An amazing encyclopedia of Southern Jewish communities, which includes um, every Jewish community in Texas. So there's like a you know, there's like a long encyclopedia article about Wharton and Victoria and, you know, Schulenburg and the, in the Tri-County area and stuff like that. Um, so we have, we have co-sponsored programs with them and we certainly lean on them um, for research. Uh, Lou mentioned New Orleans. There is a new museum of the Southern Jewish experience opening in New Orleans later this year. I hope when we've all got our, our vaccines, maybe we can make a group trip out to go see it. Uh, and visit my buddy, Ken, Ken Hoffman. Uh, we have loaned them items for their exhibit and uh, also given them some images that they've been able to reproduce for their, um, for their exhibits as well. So there's a whole network of um, uh, scholars and institutions and archives that do Southern Jewish history. It stretches from here in Texas to Charleston, South Carolina and to Atlanta, to the Bremen Museum. And it's fun to have 
this network of colleagues who are all kind of doing similar work in our own little, you know, parts of the South. Um, I've learned a lot from them in the in the few short years that I've been doing this work. Um, okay, I would like to do two things in the five plus minutes that I have left. Um, if folks have thoughts about why why Houston's Jewish community is significantly smaller than Dallas, um, I would love to hear them. I don't I don't have a ready um, I don't have a ready answer for that. I think that, you know, Houston's, I mean, Houston is the fourth largest city in the United States. Um, Houston's Jewish community obviously is not anywhere near the fourth largest um, Jewish community. I think, you know, some of the barriers to that have to do with um, folks not being interested in leaving the Northeast and leaving the larger, more well-known centers of of um, Jewish life. I know that historically I've, I've talked to people who feel like you know the oil and gas industry has not been hospitable to Jews. Um, not that it's been closed to Jews, but that it's not been perhaps as hospitable to Jews as, as other industries um, have. But um, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a better answer than that at the ready. So I'm interested to hear from you. Um, what I'd like to do now is show you where on the internet you can go to find all of the amazing Beth Yashur and historical archives that we have um, recovered and digitized. So going back to the beginning of the presentation, if you remember, the, the archive really um, was born at UOS and Beth Yashur and in the weeks after the hurricane. I mean, we would have we would have done this work anyway, but but the hurricane is what made it urgent. That's what made it imperative. Um, and one of the things that we did at working with David Bell and working with Lou Dorfman um, and the clergy was um, we acquired a set of the message of Beth Yashurin with the promise that someday we would digitize it and we would put it up on the internet such that we didn't want to have to ever worry about the next flood or worry about um, something happening and this material being lost. So the first website that I'm showing you is something called the Portal to Texas History. And I will I will try to get all these links into the chat um, as I complete them. This is a database of Texas periodicals. It's a statewide project. It's run out of the University of North Texas up in Denton. So we sent them all those volumes of the message that had been in the library um, and they digitized them. So you can see here, here's the message. And I can click on an issue. I can um, enlarge it. I can download it and I can even keyword search um, in here, right? So let's say I wanted to find something about Rabbi Malev, right? Rabbi Malev. Or let's say I grew up at Beth Yashurin and I want to find my bar mitzvah announcement or my wedding announcement or something about my parents. It's all here, um, which is just really fun and um, remarkable. So I encourage you on your own time to poke around. You can also find, independent of what we're doing, um, the folks at the Herald Voice have also been working with the Portal to Texas uh, History. And you can read many, many volumes, not all, but many old issues of the Jewish Herald Voice um, going back decades, like to the early 1900s. All right, so that's the portal to Texas history. Then uh, this is our website, jewishstudies.rice.edu. And here, oh, the days when we used to be able to gather with students. Oh man, here we are. Um, here's where you can find more information about the archive. And what I especially wanna bring your attention to um, 
besides the support the HGHA button, if you feel like uh, sending us a few dollars, is this library guide. So this is um, our catalog of physical material. So you ask, what's in the archive? What do you have? This is our best, not completely up to date, but reasonably up to date listing of all of the collections in the archive. So families that have come forward to donate um, material. And David Bell, if you're still watching, here's your collection. Um, and there are other folks that I'm sure you'll recognize and remember on here, Leon Samet and Rabinsky's and um, uh, Celine Hecht and so on and so forth. So here's that. Then we have the organizations and businesses that have donated materials to us. Josh, I don't, I'm not seeing anything other than, than the screen of our, our, our faces. Oh, did I forget? You're right, I did. Sorry, David, thank you. Yes. Here it is. So I've, I'll share this link to you guys. Here's our, here's, here's our catalog. So I, I had skipped over the, I did the individuals and families and here's organizations and businesses. Right, we've got Emery Wiener, we've got Camp Young Judea, we've got, and this is also, by the way, if you're sitting at home as we've all been for months and you've got this box of stuff from your childhood or this box of stuff from your parents or yours that's got, you know, your confirmation picture or your bar mitzvah speech or, you know, your BBYO stuff, your USY stuff, and you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to do with this junk? Um, give me a call because it's not junk to us, as you can see, hopefully here. Um, the synagogues that have donated things to us, rare books in uh, Texas Jewish history or Houston history. And then finally, of course, cookbooks. Here's our listing of um, Texas Jewish cookbooks, like the two that I talked about tonight. Um, so that's here. And then finally, and I'm almost done, and you've been very patient. This is our... Um, scholarship.rice.edu. Let me pop this in the chat for y'all and I'll tell you what this thing is. This is our digital catalog, scholarship.rice.edu. So while you're not able to come to Rice, while you're not able to come to the archive, we are trying to bring the archive to you. So here is where we put all of our digital material. And there's a wide variety of stuff. So like, for example, out of the Beth Yashurin records that uh, we preserved after Harvey, we have digitized a bunch of stuff. You can listen to two sermons of Rabbi Malev, um, the uh, first rabbi in Beth Yashurin history. Some of you I'm sure remember him. Um, you can hear his voice again. Uh, these are like the last two sermons he gave before he uh, before he died. Sisterhood scrapbooks. They're all scanned in here. You can download them. You can um, do whatever you like with them. They're here for you. We also have done a number of oral histories, as I mentioned, with folks in the community. Uh, some of them on Zoom, so there's a video component. Uh, some of them, like this one we just did last week with uh, Inez and Cheryl Eskowitz, um, using, a, using a voice recorder. So there's no picture, but you can um, learn a little bit about Houston Jewish history and life during the pandemic. Um, Irving Posman here. this is a great one. This is a former Beth Yashurin president uh, who born in Galveston, who uh, has seen a lot in his uh, 90 plus years of life. And it was a really wonderful discussion that uh, Jennifer Sutton and I had with Irving um, a couple years ago. So this is all here for you, um, free access. And we're updating it you know, once or twice a week as we, as we can. So uh, let me now just take your final comments or questions. Uh, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to um, be able to spend some time with you tonight. And I'm looking forward to maybe in a few months gathering um, in person again. Let me also put my email address in the chat and my phone number as well. So uh, if you asked a question tonight that I overlooked or something um, 
comes to you, please feel free to reach out to me. That's my email and that's my phone number. And um, that's it, guys. Thank that's you, it. Josh. That's all I got. That's a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, and we're right at our hour, so we'll be we'll be cognizant of everybody's time. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Uh, if you weren't here at the very beginning, Rabbi Strauss mentioned that the next program will be a month from today, so March the 10th, and we'll have Steve Sheldon. Uh, and in the meantime, hope you have a great month, and uh, take care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joshua. Right. Thanks, Jennifer, for hosting. You bet. Thanks, everybody. Good night, and please, please do be in touch. Take care, everyone. Everyone.